Okay, we will begin this session. Um, for those who attended uh, the previous session, I apologize for repeating this, but in the police world, one criminological theory that has really taken hold, I think, in the minds of police is routine activities theory, which postulates that crime will occur when a motivated offender encounters a suitable target or victim in some place that lacks capable guardianship. And so a lot of these policing projects we think of as either being fundamentally about the offenders, fundamentally about the victims, or predominantly about the place. These uh, projects that we presented in this session really didn't fit neatly into any of those, so we think of these as hybrid problems. Uh, all policing problems ultimately are, but these really were harder to, to categorize explicitly. So the first uh, presentation will be from um, on domestic violence and really focus on the problem as it's manifested in one city in California in the United States. And so you have uh, three presenters here, Karen Schmerler from the San Diego District Attorney's Office, Julie Wartell, a crime analysis consultant based in San Diego, and Deborah Weisel from North Carolina Central University. Thank you, Mike. So what you're going to hear about today is not only uh, a wonderful project done by the Chula Vista Police Department about reducing domestic violence, but how it led to a current project with the San Diego Prosecutor's Office about reducing domestic violence. So Karen is not now with the San Diego District Attorney's Office, but still is finishing up some work with the Chula Vista Police Department and was the lead crime analyst on the project there. So what we'd like to present to you is a hybrid of a researcher, a prosecutor perspective, and a police perspective. Karen? Okay, for those of you that have not heard of Chula Vista, which is probably most of you, uh, I wanted to give you just a sense of where we're located and what the city is like. It's a quarter of a million residents, and we're situated between the um, San Diego, we're south of San Diego, and just north of the Mexican border. So we have a very diverse population, about 60% Hispanic, 20% white, 15% uh, Asian, and 5% African American. We don't have a lot of sworn officers, you can see from these numbers, and so it's really critical for us to focus on a strategic way of policing so that we're not uh, always running from call to call. Thanks. So why domestic violence? Well, when we look at our top 10 calls for service, descending order, uh, d domestic violence is our number two call for service, second only to false burglar alarms, which isn't really a crime problem that uh, needs a lot of attention, although we've, we've done an ordinance on that. We have 4,000 DV calls for service every year, and that translates into 8,000 hours of patrol time just responding. Doesn't include report writing necessarily, doesn't include investigator time. So DV really dominates the landscape for us. One of the things I wanted to emphasize is that when we, call, when we talk about DV, we're only talking about intimate partner violence, former or current intimate partners. Um, we don't include mother-son disputes, brother-cousin. We have a separate code category for those. Um, but we do include non-crime, intimate partner, verbal disturbances. They're a big chunk of what we're dealing with, and it's an important piece of of our project. Oops. When we first started the, the effort, our research partner, Deborah Weissel, wanted us to do a funnel to see how each incident moves through the criminal justice system, from the first dispatch to the final court disposition. And as you can see, the biggest chunk of workload is the calls for service. At the top here, we have more than 10,000 DV calls over a two and a half year period. Only about a quarter of those incidents result in a DV crime report. Only about half of those result in an arrest. And that's because if the offender flees the scene, that's pretty much the end of it for them. 
Some of the more accomplished offenders know they should leave the scene. We don't have the resources to track them down unless it's a really bad DV crime. So you take those half of the incidents that have an arrest, we forward them to the prosecutor's office. They can only prosecute half of those because the evidence is lacking, no independent third party witnesses, victims don't want to cooperate understandably, and so you're cutting each, at each stage, you're cutting things almost in half. Once the prosecutor gets the case, if, the person, if they proceed, the person is usually found guilty, but very, very few people go to prison or jail. Mostly they get probation, so there aren't a lot of consequences to domestic violence. This slide just shows that we have a lot of DV that's concentrated in certain residential unique addresses. We looked at DV calls for service in a focus area and found that 6% of unique residential DV addresses accounted for 20% of all DV calls for service to homes. And this was our number two uh, call for service address, 515 Glover, number 22. You can see there were eight incidents over a six month period and they ran the gamut from verbal only calls for service to a crime, to an arrest with a crime, and then a bunch more verbal only calls for service. It didn't seem to matter that the police had been there eight times, that they'd arrested somebody, they'd written a crime report. So we wanted to try to do something differently on the front end so we wouldn't see those subsequent DV incidents. There is a rich history of research on repeat domestic violence. So we wanted to tap into that when we did our literature review, we identified three cities that had successfully measurably reduced domestic violence or the harms associated with it. High Point, North Carolina won the Goldstein Award last year or two years ago. Um, they use a classic focus deterrence approach for reducing domestic violence. Fremont, California, Northern California, tried unannounced follow-ups at seven and 28 days, more or less, with both parties. And West Yorkshire and England used a tiered or graded approach. So they intensified their response each time officers were called back to the same location. There are a couple of themes that are common with, both, with these three projects. One is that they focus on the offender in terms of holding them accountable. They do not expect the victim to leave the relationship, to, to, to somehow change the dynamics of the relationship. That's between the police and the offender. And the victims, we've been told, appreciate the burden being off of their shoulders and shifted to the police for assistance. So I mentioned this earlier, the biggest chunk of calls, DV calls that we receive are actually non-crime verbal calls for service. And so we wanted to be sure to develop a response that captured and targeted that big chunk of workload. Um, we ended up taking pieces of High Point, Fremont, and West Yorkshire and customized a hybrid model that we thought fit the dynamics in Chula Vista. So the first part of this very low level first response was an educational form, uh, professionally designed. Officers handed it to both parties when they went on the disturbance call and they said, you know what, we're taking a new approach. We take DV seriously. This is not okay. Couples argue all the time, but the police don't show up at your door all the time. And we can't have this continue this way. If you have kids, um, the loud yelling alone detrimentally affects their brain development. Um, and we're gonna check in on you and make sure you're okay. Part two of this message was a follow-up text that we customized to each person, hey Nancy, Nancy, how are you doing? Uh, we wanted to make sure you're okay. Can you answer a couple of questions for us with a follow-up survey, three questions? And the response was positive. People said, I'm good, thanks. Thank you for checking. First DV crime response has two components as well. If the offender was arrested at the jail booking, uh, the officer read them an 11-point warning. It was pretty stern. They asked them to sign the warning. Typical elements were, if you flee in the future, we're gonna track you down, which is not, had not been their experience. And you're subject to unannounced visits from now on, and they definitely did not like that. 
Then officers did an in-person follow-up around three days unannounced, and they'd come up to the victim's house, typically knock on the door. Um, hey, we're here. We wanted to check and make sure everybody's okay. They'd go inside if they were let inside. And it was a real psychological message sent to the offender, like, we're still, we've still got our eye on you. Um, we haven't forgotten about this. We're here. You didn't call us. And it, it kind of freaked him out sometimes. But it also sent a message to the victim, we haven't forgotten you either. We want to make sure that you're safe. If nobody was home, officers left this card. Uh, it was professionally designed, kind of catchy, on the door that just said, we stopped by, we wanted to make sure you're, you're doing well, call us if you need anything. Finally, the most intensive response that we implemented was for our chronic couples, our chronic repeat offenders. In some cases, these were low-level uh, verbal abuse situations that were ongoing, or crimes that couldn't really be prosecuted, text violations via, uh, TRO violations via text, for example. And so, our program coordinator sat down and met with these couples, about 60 of them, spent like an hour with them, identified the dynamics of the incidents and who, they could, who she could engage to make them change their behavior. Parents, siblings, landlords, employers. This particular couple, there's a picture here on this slide. Um, our Santee, the coordinator, sat down with them and said, listen, this can't go on. We have to figure this out. And she said, I'm going to keep coming back until this is better. And so the victim wrote a note on the wall that said, the detective will check on you every day, or check on us every day, taped our flyer up, and it was a visual reminder that the offender, every time he walked past her, got past that wall that the police were going to be there to check up on things. So the question is, did this work? And to that, I'm going to turn to our research partner to answer the question. Oops, you know what? These go backwards in uh, Sweden. Okay. Well, after you implement this excellent uh, treatment or response by the police, the natural question that most of us would want to know is, did it work? And certainly if Herman Goldstein were sitting next to us and, oh my goodness, I think he's here. Hello, Herman. Uh, Herman wanted to say, what, did it work? Was it effective or not? And what's the evidence you have to show whether all the treatment and effort you put into this heavily officer involved in development had any impact on domestic violence or not. So we were able to develop, initially the police wanted to do this citywide. We developed a, a equivalent matched quasi-experiment where we had two matched areas of the city to compare with on our treatment. Sector one, which is on the top of the screen up here, uh, is very, it was our target experimental area, and sector two on the bottom of the screen was a match comparison area where we did no, none of the police treatment at all. They're very closely matched. They are both about 50,000 population, sector two slightly larger population. Importantly, they're both about 70% Hispanic, and being that close to the Mexico border, that's a unique characteristic we wanted to pay careful attention to in our match on it. But much more important, actually, is they had virtually the same identical trends in domestic violence crime and calls. Sector 2 was slightly higher, but they matched lockstep over multiple years in terms of their volume and their rise and fall in domestic violence crime and calls. So we knew at the outset this would be a good match for doing our quasi-experimental design. The treatment was going to occur in Sector 1 that Karen talked about today. Uh, when you look at this, the first thing when you look at the response is Karen just told you about the level one treatment for just the verbal only, level two for the crime, level three for the more persistent offenders, and level four for the really committed people who need a little extra oomph uh, to, in their response treatment there. What we're able to find out here is that in terms of what we implemented over a course of about 18 months, a year and a half, we had just over 400 of our level one treatments, the educational message given to the verbal only domestic violence offenders. When we look at the face-to-face -face warnings delivered by officers to a DV crime and a three-day follow-up, we had nearly 300 and almost 500 of those respectively, so they're kind of layered uh, treatment that's implemented there. For our highest level, we had about 25 groups that were chronic groups that really need some extra attention to follow up on them. 
and for our most intense folks who needed, had very different characteristics and more uh, non-police involved responses implemented, we only had about our 25 of those. So most of our effort was at the front end for the low level people who were involved in these situations. So we look at what impact measures this treatment had on five different specific measures I'll share with you today, which will be domestic violence crime, domestic violence calls for service to the police, we looked at the, the satisfaction of the people who were involved in the nonverbal, uh, in the verbal only calls, the response of the people who were domestic violence victims, and fifth was the response of the police officers. How did police feel about carrying out this treatment? Did they think that it had an impact or not? So I'll discuss each one of those briefly. The most important one people tend to look at, and I have simplified our analysis up here just for the sake of our presentation today, but if you can see on the left side of your screen is sector one, and on the right hand side is our control area, sector two. Well, the thing that immediately probably will catch your mind is sector two, domestic violence crime was the same before, during, and after our response treatment. We use weekly averages. We have a long period of time here. We have almost 300 weeks in our total project that we're looking at data points here. But it stayed virtually spot on the same. There's no significant difference between any time period and the project. In sector one, we start off at about eight uh, domestic violence crimes per week, was our baseline average. And after a year of the project implementation, it didn't happen right away, but after a year, we dropped 23% to 6.3 domestic violence crimes per week. That's 24, 23%, excuse me, reduction there, which obviously is, is very significant in a city which is already relatively low crime rate. Um, after the project had been in place for about 18 months, the department paused the project because they're looking at expanding this citywide and they're in the midst of doing that still. And look what happened to our crime, went right back up to the baseline level. So I probably would have preferred not to have a pause. However, the fact that the DV crime went right back up to the pre-project level, really to the police, people who were skeptical reinforced, oh, it, what you did really did work. And there are no other explanations for it that could be in place there. So a very important, I think, interpretation of this in terms of our impact. Um, good enough, Herman, you think? Hopefully in there. The next thing we look at were domestic violence calls. That's our big volume leader. So I'll just show you, if you look at this line graph, the top line, the blue line, is sector one, our experimental area. I told you it's a little bit higher than sector two. And our impact on domestic violence calls were much more modest than our impact on crime. Uh, you can see that in sector one, domestic violence calls went up as we went into the project and then started a modest decline uh, later on during the 18 month period. I actually interpret this as, as a positive indicator that our treatment did not suppress calls. People were still willing to call the police for assistance, but there were not crimes arising from those calls. So we feel like that's an indication of we didn't prevent people from calling the police particularly with our Hispanic victims who might be concerned about uh, immigration issues and suppress the calls to the police. We feel like this is a good indication that no calls didn't go down substantially and that's not a bad thing. It's a good indicator that we were being more effective in there and not just suppressing people calling the police in there. The third impact measure that we looked at were the text follow-ups Karen talked about to you. It was a treatment and an impact measure because we looked at just in the one sector, people replied back how they felt about the police interaction in there. Again, these are verbal only uh, texts going to both, the su both subjects because you're not a crime and a victim there, a criminal and an offender, you're just subjects in there. And 88% of all verbal only subjects said they, things have gotten better since the police had responded to the level one or two uh, treatment earlier, 30 days earlier we shot for on that. In addition, 81% of the subjects who responded said that, that police had helped the problem, so it wasn't a negative reaction to it at all. And overall, the bottom line, again, looking at where we're suppressing calls, we had about 8% who said that they would not call the police again, but 92% were willing to call the police again. So again, a, a robust indicator that sort of validated that we didn't suppress the calls here. Our next element that we looked at was a survey of victims that was conducted by a victim advocacy group that works with the police department. These are not officers, they are citizen advocates who provide services to victims. 
crime victims, and they conducted a very couple, few questions after the police response, and they asked people, were they satisfied with the police response? We don't expect everyone to say yes, because many victims may not want the subject uh, arrested. They might not have that type of reaction to it, but we identified it, and the victim advocates were unaware of the sector one, sector two difference in there, but yet we see in our impact results that overall, 97% of the victims in sector one reported being satisfied with the police response, compared to 81% in sector two. This is not a really significant difference. We have a pretty low number of people involved in this, but again, it reinforced that there was something going on here uh, supporting our overall view on this. And last but not least, I think it's an important thing, we ask the officers who can often be quite cynical um, and opposed to different types of initiatives and responding to things. We did surveys before and after, but at the end, among the officers, the DART officers involved in their DV project, we asked them whether the project should be expanded within the police department. And as you can see quite strongly on the board here is 66% said yes, definitely. The people who said no, 24%, still something to be shown, I suppose, in there. And 11% said that it should not be expanded in the police department. Um, I think this is fairly positive. I don't expect everyone to buy on board for it. And our last measure we hear from the officers is about whether they felt the DV initiative had been effective. And they're even stronger, nearly 80% of officers said that yes, that it had been effective in reducing repeat domestic violence. So a good strong take here. Uh, we're moving on with our evaluation here, but in the meantime, we're also expanding the project, as Julie will tell you about. Um, how this got into the DA's office, our, our district attorney, our local prosecutor, is that the head of, of domestic violence prosecution, that's Karen up there, a picture of Karen did a presentation about their project that they were working on in Chula Vista, and the prosecutor, people need to be old enough to use those phones, but uh, the prosecutor called me and said, can we do this? And I said, what's this? Look at our data for repeats. I said, after working here 10 years, you would hope that they would uh, be able to do that. We all sat around a table and said, well, what can we look at within prosecution? Where is our role in this system? Did a bunch of basic stats that I'll talk about in a minute and presented that back out to this larger group of Domestic Violence Council, Law Enforcement Working Group, and everyone agreed, let's move forward with doing further analysis, and we just started on a project with Deborah and Karen to dive deeper into doing a few more things. So what we found was out of 45,000 cases in five years, we had 34,000, a little over, defendants. Um, what we call when we receive a case into the prosecutor's system, 19% of these people accounted for 38% of the crimes, and 1%, we had two people that had 14 cases in five years each. So we were seeing a lot of repeats, and that was a big workload issue. So our idea for this further project is how can we focus our limited resources within prosecution to get at the top, the worst of the worst, and what does that mean? So we're working on an algorithm to say, well, what does that mean? Is it a frequency? Is it a lethality? And so looking at a number of factors, and not just the most serious in terms of crimes, but we have a lot of low-level violating restraining orders, things like that, that we're going through the system over and over again. We're gonna attempt a warning message. We don't know exactly what that means, but as you heard from Karen, a lot of the people that are arrested come to prosecution and they say, sorry, we can't prosecute. Two thirds of them countywide. So we're taking Chula Vista's project, trying to expand it countywide and say, what else can we do within the prosecutors and courts to help reduce repeat domestic violence? And that's it. A minute over, huh, Mike? <laughs> I'll give you that. Okay. Okay, so our next presentation will be by Professor Johannes Knudsen, who is uh, by birth and temperament a Swede, but who has done a lot of his work, including the work he'll describe here in Norway uh, when he was with the Norwegian Police College. Okay, so how...
stopwatch. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I'll start with giving you a little background how I did come up with supporting the project that ended up with trying to do something about illegal cabs in a small police force in Norway. And the whole adventure, uh, sorry, we will... No, it doesn't work. Yeah, here, here we go, here we go. Okay. Like that, yes. Uh, as soon as I, I got to know of problematic policing, I got interested in trying to follow the, what happened. And in the uh, UK, they started pretty early to, to practice problematic policing, but uh, follow-ups from Home Office showed weak implementation. And uh, in... Scandinavian countries, uh, in 1995, there was a major reform in Sweden, and promoting policing was supposed to be the approach to prevent crimes, and Norway and Denmark followed a couple of years later, but with the same end result, weak implementations. And, uh, oh, this, uh, yes, and uh, Ron Clark and I, uh, had a conversation in Australia, you know, inspired by nature. And then we started to discuss how come weak implementation, can we do something about it? And then we suggested, why don't we make a book where we invite experts, that they can reflect on how come and how to proceed. And Ron was a little pessimistic, but I said that, okay, I'll meet the Norwegian police director next week. I think I can persuade her. And yes, I was successful. So one year later, we had a conference in Norway, and there are six present here that attended the conference. And uh, the end product was a book called Problem Oriented Policing, published in 2003. And one conclusion was we need good, solid case studies. OK, I said, why don't I try to do well? So uh, at a conference in Norway with all police commissioners from Norway, I raised my hand and said, please, if you've got a problem, get in touch with me because I need a problem so I can support you. And uh, one commissioner, he said, I have a problem uh, and uh, it's about illegal taxi cabs. We have had local media attention. It's, uh, uh, there are alleges of rape and uh, assaults, and the legal cab drivers are really upset because we, don't, we can't do anything about it. And they had tried to uh, crack down, invested about $40,000 overtime money, which young police officers really like. Uh, and the issue was, could Paul Prop solve the problem? So I said, well, yeah, I think so. So we uh, started uh, thinking on how to do it. Turnsberg is a small city, 36,000 inhabitants, but it has a vibrant nightlife because people from the other communities, they go to Turnsberg because there are lots of pubs, bars, and restaurants, etc. So I made a plan with the commissioner on how to proceed. And I think that's one of the success factors. We had a good working, uh, working relationship, so he trusted me. He believed that I was pretty knowledgeable. And I said that we'll do it my way. So if I give you an instruction, you have to do it. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure that we will end up with a good project. Now I'll go back a little. How come we have had these weak implementations? And I think it's because people on the whole haven't had the, the knowledge. They lack the analytic competence. 
and, and uh, skills in methods that it takes to conduct proper problem multi policing. And for instance, in Sweden, there was a decision made in the Department of Justice. Now we're going to have problem multi policing. The police commissioners made a plan. Next year, we'll have two problem multi policing projects, and then they assign some officer. You go about and do a little problem multi policing. And especially if uh, they are victim of a uh, uh, new public management regime, then there are also uh, pressure to, re to present good results. And this ends up in uh, the instrumental mode of conducting problem multi policing problem, where often in advance they have decided about the response week and inadequate analysis, focus on response, and no evaluation. What I wanted to do was to follow the original recipe from, uh, or vision from Hermann Goldstein. If you put in a knowledgeable analyst, uh, then that will change the whole thing. That person, he will communicate with the leaders, explain them what it takes. He will also support the practitioners. But an analyst, he doesn't identify with the system. He has an identification, a self-picture, self-image as an academic. So he also has connections, uh, ties with academia, where he can have, get support if he needs. This will make conceptual mode of practicing problem multi policing po possible. So that was my aim, to try to do some proper problem-oriented policing. Uh, given the, the problems they had encountered earlier, I took a lot of steps to safeguarding the project's integrity. So I started with a meeting with the uniformed chief of the uniformed police, for him to describe the problem in detail. And as usual, very vague, I thought, oh, how big is a fleet? Oh, many cars, but how, how large is a fleet? No idea, but it was a huge problem and it was a fleet that operated. Okay. Next thing, site visit. If you're about to support police, you have to have first-hand knowledge. So I started out with uh, two night shifts in the police force to uh, see what it's all, what is all about. And this is a problem area. Uh, there are lots of bars, discotheques, restaurants, etc., uh, in the downtown area. And uh, there is a highway that passes through, so they close it off. If you have a lot of drunken people running back and forth, that creates a traffic hazard. So these barriers are closed early on, or around 10 o'clock, Friday evening, Saturday evening, and open up very early in the morning. And that's uh, where the problem was located. Okay, next stop, step for me was to inform all the senior leaders. Something will happen in your police district. Some resources will be used for this. This is me, and this is what it's all about. Next step was, for the police commissioner to pick out a really good, talented uh, uh, young police officer who should be uh, the project manager. And I also said that he must be able to work full time when there is needed in this project. So they've uh, reserved a sum of money in the police budget to release him from his ordinary duty. And then I explained the principles for all middle rank leaders. That's a critical group, because if they don't agree, you have a problem. OK, so next step was to uh, uh, plan the scanning. So I spent two night shift with the project manager, and we immediately got a very good working relationship. So we spent some hours. Uh, on the street, back to the police station, and we started to formulate different hypotheses. And all these were solution-oriented. For instance, the cars. Is there something with them that we can use? Uh, or 
Is it a lot of money involved? Maybe we could hint to the tax authority that here is something for you guys. Uh, driver's background, were they asylum seekers? Uh, because that was what the police believed. Uh, and then next thing was to decide on how to conduct the scanning. We have decided about the hypothesis. So uh, we decided to um, see where the problem was uh, occurring. Let's see if I, something happened. Yes, scanning, yeah. Examples of questions uh, that we had to answer. And uh, there were rich uh, data available that, that we could use from the crackdowns. But we also had to use other methods in order to be able to respond, to, re to, uh, uh, to answer the, the issues. So we used systematic social observation. Uh, we did record checks. We got names for, for, on, on the drivers and identities. And if you are a witness in a complaint, you have been a customer. And we also decided that we could interview the illegal cab drivers indirectly because there was a network with people who support or supported the illegal cab drivers. And we figured out that if we have a, a police officer, a female police officer in civilian clothes, then they do, wouldn't mind to ask questions. Ethically, we decided that she had to identify herself as a police officer, but then it's up to them if they want to talk to her or not, and also to arrange a focus interview with the legitimate cab, cab drivers. All these methods are used by the police, but for different purposes. For instance, systematic observation, stakeouts, when you check if uh, there is a drug, uh, Peddling from an apartment, for instance. Okay. So next, localization. And we decided to do systematic observations from a roof and from uh, an office that we could use, binoculars, sheet of paper, and to uh, uh, register the, the cars and their registration numbers and over times, how often they appeared, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is what we came up with, that the illegal cab drivers picked up their customers on two parking lots, and one of them, sorry, one of them was uh, organized like an ordinary cab stand, the, the one uh, on the lower part of the picture. And they also actively recruited passengers on the closed area section, only cab drive, legitimate cabs, and police cars could move on that uh, closed area. And there was no sign of an organization with taxi chain, which the police believed. So next thing, analysis. And at, actually, that wasn't really difficult, because you could figure out immediately that we do have an imbalance between demand and supply of, of, of uh, transport. But we also found out that the illegal cabs were much more available than the legal ones. Could we do something about that? And then there were also some other causes, shall we say, but we concentrated on, on the third three, uh, sorry, two causes above. So response. The issue was how can we make illegal means less available and legal more accessible? And the answer was, of course, that we could manipulate and extend the uh, closed section of the highway. If we moved the barriers and closed off uh, the parking lots that they used to uh, recruit their passengers, then we would change the opportunity structure. So in my mind, uh, these were the more substantial steps. But we also uh, saw to, uh, in the project, they also organized uh, a new cab stand and also moved the night buses, buses making them more available. 
And there were a couple of organizations that they had to uh, discuss with, but these discussions went fairly well. Assessment. Well, actually, the change situation was obvious. So it was difficult to persuade the middle rank leaders that we need resources to really measure this. But uh, still, uh, we, had, we did observations. New focus interview and legal cab drivers were extremely pleased with the new situation. Uh, and uh, it wasn't possible to interview the uh, uh, illegal cab drivers associates because they had disappeared. And the whole setting had changed. Actually, the first time I was a little scared myself. Uh, I was approached by two of these and I thought that they would beat me up. So I feared that I would have end up in an emergency ward at the hospital, but I didn't. Uh, and then, of course, we could have an unintended negative effect, namely that if there are more persons in this downtown area, maybe we will get uh, uh, more problems with assaults, but no signs of deterioration. So to sum up, we had a successful project and the result has been has sustained over time. And I also... Uh, accomplished what I set out to do in the beginning. So there were, I authored a textbook published in both Sweden and Norway, and I think it's still in use, even if it was published in 2005. And another thing, Ron Clark persuaded me to send a submission to the Hermann Goldstein Award, and we became runner-ups. So here we have a proud um, problem, uh, the project manager. And to me it started a problem because this was too successful, given the expectations I had. How come? So I decided to do a follow-up study and interview the different key persons. And that was published in a book that I edited with Ronald Clark. And to sum up, I think that the contributing factors was uh, the engagement of the commissioner, that, that he wanted this to happen. And he put himself as chairman in a steering group. And he, as an experienced administrator, he knew that these projects are vulnerable. So he wanted to uh, check it. But also he sent a very powerful signal to his uh, Police, I want this to happen. And I think also we had this very close relationship that helped, I also think. The ambitious and competent project manager, and we also had a good working relationship. He had been taught promoting policing at the academy, but he had no idea how careful you had to be. So to, he, to him, that, that was something new. You really had to be very careful. Uh, necessary resources set aside, information to middle rank leaders. They didn't like me to start with because I disturbed what they were doing. But then when it was a success, success it changed. And last but not least, I'm convinced that uh, the very thorough scanning we did uh, meant that we could uh, present a compelling evidence. This is a problem. And when I interviewed the city administration, the, uh, the chairman of the city council, they mentioned that. We knew that it was a problem, but we had no idea that it was serious. And, and they also complimented the police for doing such a careful problem description. So that's about it. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Johannes. Okay. Our third presentation will be from Canada, and Professor Rick Linden from the University of Manitoba, Canada, uh, will discuss a project related to auto thefts 
in Manitoba. If I can get it. Thanks, Ron. Back in 2001, I had the good fortune of being asked by our Minister of Justice to try and lead a provincial task force to deal with what was certainly one of the largest uh, urban crime waves in the modern history of, of our country. Uh, some of the dimensions of this, uh, the, the, pro the problem was auto theft. And between 2001 and 2008, and I think virtually every one of those years, Winnipeg was the auto theft capital of North America or at least the part of North America that's not Mexico. Uh, we were not just number one, but we were 80% higher than number two, uh, which for most of that time was Modesto, California. Uh, we were four times the Canadian average, uh, and the for some reason the statistic that uh, I find shakes me the most is that of all the crime in Winnipeg, 20% were auto thefts. Uh, the total was about 14,000 thefts a year in a city of 700,000 people. And we make up about 2% of the Canadian population. We made up about 10% of the auto thefts. So there was a very significant problem. The cost was over $40 million a year. Uh, it would have been much higher, except for reasons I'll get into. The, the uh, thieves were stealing really cheap cars. Uh, if you just look at the left side of this, I'll deal with the, with the right-hand side, which is the drop. But on the left, you see the year starting in 1991. And back in those days, we were... Uh, we had about 2,300 vehicles a year stolen. And you can see there was a steady increase from 93 up to 2004 and then another peak in 2006 when we were up to the 14,000 level. So it was a, a, a really amazing increase. Uh, the problem, of course, wasn't just people losing their vehicles, but it was dangerous. And it was particularly dangerous because of the nature of the auto thieves in our city uh, they were almost all young offenders. Some of them were under 12. In fact, at one time, the two probably highest rate offenders in Winnipeg were 11-year-old twins. And uh, below 12 in Canada, you can't even be arrested. So it was, it was quite an a issue dealing with them. Uh, but these kids were stealing cars at all hours of the day and night, driving around the city looking for excitement. And there's a quote from one of the kids we interviewed about the adrenaline rush, which... Uh, is as good an explanation for this kind of crime as any. Uh, on occasion, they did steal for transportation, so they'd steal a car at one shopping center, drive across the city to another shopping center, abandon it, go to a movie or something, then steal another car when they, when they went back to the other side of the city. But in a lot of cases, it was simply for the excitement of doing it. And that, of course, led to several deaths and, and uh, a number of serious injuries. Uh, just uh, something else that tells you something about these young people. Uh, during one 16-month period, there were eight cases where drivers deliberately targeted stolen uh, vehicles at police officers. And a couple of the headlines, this was a really tragic case. The, the Saturday before Mother's Day, uh, the young mother of, of three boys was uh, on her way to work in the morning, and her car was smashed into by the, the car in the background, which was driven by a, a, a youth stolen car and, uh, and killed her. Uh, the next one was uh, a couple years later, which was uh, a cab driver who was killed on the main street of our city by kids who were driving around in a, in a fairly large truck. Uh, that's this one here. And uh, I think, you know, given that we're here this week to, uh, to honor Professor Goldstein, I just wanted to make the comment that when the minister asked me to chair the task force, uh, he also asked me if I wanted the per diem rate that they gave to uh, people who were part-time chairs of boards and commissions, and I said, I'll be happy to forgo the drain on your budget if you give me your commitment that we can do this according to the principles of problem-oriented policing. And when I explained to him what it was, he said, yeah, I, can, I, I think I can live with that. And to his credit, both he and his two successors absolutely lived up to it. They enthusiastically backed it. And to get into the issue of why do some of these things succeed and others don't, uh, the notion of the, the leaders at the top being on side, uh, it's really important if you have a cabinet minister who's, who's behind you on something like this. 
Uh, so what did we do? Well, of course, the first stage is, is to analyze the problem. Uh, the offense pattern, most of the vehicles were recovered, 90%. Uh, the pattern was strictly joyriding. Uh, very few of these cars were ever stolen for profit, unlike, say, Montreal, where the recovery rate was about 45% uh, because they were being shipped offshore. Uh, the police weren't doing anything about the problem. The clearance rate was 10%, so they, they weren't going to arrest their way out of the problem. Uh, we, there weren't any real monthly or day of week patterns. Uh, one of, and so the last three uh, points on the slide are actually the keys to our solving the problem. One is that uh, Chrysler products were particularly vulnerable. I think back in about 1987, the chairman of Chrysler called together his best engineers and said, I want you to design some vehicles that an 11-year-old kid can get into and start with a screwdriver as fast as anybody else can with a key. And what they came up with was the uh, Plymouth Voyager and the Dodge Caravan, which actually fit those specifications perfectly. And for those of you that know about risk rates, a risk rate of stolen vehicles of one in four means that basically if you own your car for four years, it's going to be stolen. Uh, so these cars were, were very much at risk. I've mentioned the youth involvement, and the other thing we found was that uh, there was only a, a relatively small number of youth, uh, between 100 and 150, who were the high-rate offenders, who were doing most of the stealing. To find out a little more about it, we interviewed uh, 43, one of my grad students and I interviewed 43 uh, kids who had been incarcerated, and the, uh, the backgrounds, anybody who's been in criminology knows what the backgrounds of these youth was. Uh, the uh, uh, thrill-seeking lifestyle, it was no surprise to us that their favorite video game was Grand Theft Auto. That wasn't a coincidence, probably. Uh, they were gang-involved to some degree. Uh, one of the things that surprised me a little bit wasn't the peers, but the, the involvement of relatives. Uh, there were a lot of family connections between the kids doing this, and they tended to be learning it from older brothers and cousins and things like that. Uh, it was impulsive, they didn't actually pre-plan, they'd just be walking along the street and see a car they knew how to steal and, and would take it. Uh, they were also involved in, in a broad range of offenses, and as I mentioned, they started uh, very young, so the average age when they first got involved was 12. Now, we, we sort of did a few things for the first couple years that seemed to have a modest impact, uh, probably actually didn't. Uh, the politicians passed some meaningless legislation just to show they were concerned about the problem. Uh, but things came to a head in 2004 when in the fall of 2004 we were in a crisis. Uh, we finally learned how committed these kids were to auto theft. If any of you have experienced minus 35 temperatures that we regularly have in the winter in, in my province, uh, you know that you have to be dedicated to get out of bed and go and steal cars in that kind of weather or walk to the store or do anything because it's really cold. The rates were out of control, and in the last three months of 2004, uh, the annualized rate was 3,000 per 100,000, which would have been uh, three times higher than any other place in North America. Some of the kids were stealing four or five cars a day. Uh, they were just stealing, it, stealing them to steal them. They would steal them, abandon them, and then take another one. And the city was being terrorized by auto theft. Some of the kids were uh, deliberately running down joggers. Uh, on, uh, on very quiet streets in town. And one of them, that act this actually preceded the current trend towards driverless cars, but they were putting concrete blocks on gas pedals and turning the cars loose down the street and into underground parking garages. And that, you know, hopefully the new version of driverless cars are gonna be a little safer than that. Anyway, because of this, uh, this crisis, when, when rates were going off the clock, uh, we, the whole task force had a meeting with the minister and his, his message was, let's get something done. And so th each of the actors, uh, the people on the commission who were, or, or on the task force who were responsible for different pieces of it, uh, put in their request. We hired 15 people in corrections, probation officers, to, to work with auto theft offenders. We had two crowns dedicated to prosecuting because the justice system didn't take auto theft very seriously as a, as a crime. Uh, the police stole an auto unit, got increased personnel, and we established a, a coordinated approach based on the risk levels of youth. And should explain here, most of this was paid by Manitoba Public Insurance. We have in three Canadian provinces, uh, all auto insurance is done by a Crown Corporation, which is owned by the government. 
And so we had control over the insurance company's money, and this is not something you'd find in a normal kind of jurisdiction, uh, even in the other Canadian provinces. We'll go through the levels. The first one, level one, was just educational things for kids, young kids, six, seven years old, in, in areas where there were high rates of auto theft. Uh, but it's the level four kids that we were focused on. And the response was focused deterrence. Uh, the the uh, uh, social workers in, auto, in the auto theft unit and the police stolen auto unit uh, were, were very aggressive about uh, following, tracking these kids. And of course, for focused deterrence, the basic principle is certainty. Keep your promises, be certain, not severe. Uh, we would incarcerate people if they violated the conditions of their release, but not for long. Uh, it enabled us to concentrate the enforcement resources, and for the from the judge's perspective, if they gave a community sanction, they knew it was going to be enforced. And so the, uh, and this is how intrusive it was. Uh, the, these uh, high-risk offenders, the 100 to 150 who were on our list, uh, would be contacted in person or by phone every three hours, seven days a week. And because the parents were starting to get really upset, we, we gave them a six-hour break most nights, uh, but not for all the kids. Any curfews were applied and enforced, and there was not quite zero tolerance, but limited tolerance for non-compliance. And this was tough, but over time, we actually had many fewer incarcerated youth than we had at the start. And then the other part is in many of the focused deterrence programs, there was an off-ramp. Uh, the probation officers and the auto theft support workers made thousands and thousands of calls to uh, teachers, parents, uh, potential employers and stuff trying to help the kids out. The other key to it, and this is where the money of our, of our insurance company came in, uh, when we finally realized how difficult this was going to be, uh, we convinced the, uh, the uh, CEO of the insurance company to put in uh, mandatory immobilizers. And these were really effective, you know, high standard immobilizers for first the 50,000 and then another 50,000 of the highest risk vehicles. So you couldn't steal a Dodge Caravan anymore because they were all immobilized. And in the, since this started, we've not had one of these immobilizers defeated by by a thief, lots of cars still stolen, uh, left running or with the keys, but, uh, <clears throat> but the immobilizers can't be defeated. And in two, like in many other countries, in 2007, partly as a result of lobbying of our task force in the province, all new vehicles in Canada had to have uh, high standard immobilizers. And so over time, the fleet gradually became uh, virtually impossible to steal without keys. Now, if we look at the period 2006 to 2013, uh, the reductions in Winnipeg, and uh, that the graph is a little out of scale, but the, uh, the reductions were 84% uh, drop in Winnipeg and 48% in the rest of Canada. So it kind of fits the cliff edge thing, except it took four or five years to slowly tumble down the cliff. But the, the reductions in, in each of those years were was quite substantial. And total, uh, the total reduction was almost 12,000 a year, fewer thefts uh, at the end of this process than at the beginning. The displacement issue, the uh, particularly conservative media who just wanted us to lock the kids up forever, but there was no laws by which we could have done that even if we wanted, said that, oh, if you, if you stop them from stealing cars, they'll just do other stuff. But they didn't. Uh, when the, uh, when the uh, pressure was most intense, we had fewer burglaries and robberies as well as, as uh, car thefts. And carjackings, they said, would be a huge problem, but it wasn't. We only had about one a week of those, and, and that, uh, that continued. And the savings were over four, $40 million a year, and uh, citizens of Manitoba just got that back and reduced uh, uh, premiums. And this is what happened with, uh, with the rate. You can see how it, it declined uh, following 2006. It's, it dropped every year until 2011, uh, where it got to a level that we're pretty much at today. So uh, the question that came up earlier today about do these things last, well, yes, this one, this one has lasted. And we're still a little bit above the Canadian average, but, uh, but it's, it's controllable. We're down just a little over 2,000 auto thefts a year, which is actually uh, fewer than we had back in 1991. Uh, some of the principles that we used in this uh, problem area policing, obviously, uh, and one of the things that, uh, that we, we found is that 
uh, until we adequately resourced the program, it, it wasn't effective and it would not have been effective. There's a tipping point. Uh, if you don't put an, an adequate effort into something, the change won't happen. And this was a significant amount of money. Uh, the, just the mandatory immobilizer program itself, we put in 100,000 and the cost of each of them was $400 installed. So that's $40 million that, uh, that was invested in, in that particular part of the program. Uh, the other was a team approach. We, we worked very closely together. And in fact, when we interviewed people who were on the task force, they said the thing they liked best about it, besides succeeding with the program, was actually getting to work with other parts of the justice system, because they said we never worked together, but this gave us a chance to do it. Even played baseball together and stuff. And we used a comprehensive evidence-based strategy. So we used uh, enforcement techniques, social development techniques, working with the kids and their families, situational techniques with the immobilizer and community partnerships, uh, particularly with the insurance company. Uh, implementation issues, uh, it took a long time. There were lots of hurdles, uh, but that's, that's normal in any kind of program. Essentially, there were no major issues that came up and said, this is, you know, we're, we're just not going to make it. It was uh, as trouble-free as you can actually make something like this. And again, I've credited that to, uh, to the, uh, the Auto Insurance Corporation. And uh, fortunately, it actually came under the mandate of the Minister of Justice. So the same person was involved with both. So we were able to convince the CEO of the insurance company to, to cooperate. And she was enthusiastic about it anyway. Um, just in terms of, of another consequence, uh, success breeds success. And so once the, uh, the program worked and it was seen to be uh, viable, uh, it was much easier to sell other programs to the Winnipeg Police Service. And I've just listed there a few of different things. We ran a, a gang program, which was based on the Falcons deterrence principle, community mobilization, which is involving all kinds of social agencies uh, dealing with, uh, with problem families. Uh, we ran a smart policing initiative that was successful. And uh, we're currently uh, getting up and running with a project that will focus on, on downtown addicted and alcoholic homeless people. Uh, all of which are evidence-based. So that's it. Thank you, Rick. Uh, entertain any questions or comments from the audience? Stuart, if you would just wait for the microphone so we can record your brilliant question. Thank you. Uh, this one for Chula Vista. Uh, so two questions. What is it about Chula Vista where there's so much domestic violence, do you think? And secondly, uh, I was really interested in the chronic couples because often it's offender victim and there's a very clear line between them. And I just wondered whether you saw any dynamics within the chronic couples that you didn't see in much more polarized uh, relationships. Yeah, um, as far as domestic violence in Chula Vista, I think because we added our disturbance only intimate partner calls, that brings it up quite a bit. And if other agencies did that as well, they'd see the same thing. Um, as far as the offender victim dynamics going back and forth, occasionally we saw that. Um, there was usually a primary aggressor, but as I'm sure you've heard in some of the media, there's, there's escalation within a personal relationship, like so-and-so does something that sets so-and-so off, and then a chain reaction happens and there ends up being physical contact, but it's not quite as cut and dried as it looks. Gary? Uh, I guess sort of a data question. Um, I, I think I remember, I, I may not remember correctly, uh, a Charlotte project years ago focused on domestic violence and trying to identify repeats. And what fascinated me with their project was that when they focused on addresses, uh, th they found some chronic locations, but not nearly as many as they thought. Um, and eventually they figured out that sometimes the same two people uh, have a lot of incidents, but they don't all occur at home. So they might occur at work or at the mall or, you know, so multiple locations involving the same two people. Or uh, that they move. Or they move, yeah, yeah darn it. 
so I, I wonder if you were able to look at that at all or if you think that affects the way you look at this kind of a problem. Uh, you, do you want to answer that one? We really haven't finished examining that yet, but it's clear just from, because we're looking at some other tighter impact measures first, but it is clear that people moved, and even as Karen mentioned earlier, half of all the domestic violence calls, there's, there, they, there's not a crime that's occurred in law, and the police don't find the people. So they're out, they're about, they use different names. We have had an extensive name matching effort going on. Uh, so we're interested in those, the mobility issues, we haven't quite sorted them out yet. The, um, about 30% of the calls go to non-unique residential locations. So the most common was the sidewalk. We have good weather. Um, with homeless folks, those couples tend to move to different places and show up in different places. It kind of varies based on the nature of the couple. It sounds like you did make an attempt to connect up people as well as just addresses then. And you're We're okay. trying to, but trying it's, to. it's hard. Our CAD system isn't designed to capture names. I just think, addresses. Yeah, yeah. And then another thing, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, from that Charlotte project years ago, was that also the same two people uh, might show up in, in non-DV calls. Absolutely. It might just be harassment or trespassing or, you know, some other kinds of things. Yeah, we, we looked at that too. And for the chronic or the DV repeats, for every one DV call, there were two non-DV calls. Somewhat related, potentially, like a noise complaint or check the welfare, but yeah, they generate a lot of it's very chaotic situations. Hmm. Ron. Thank you. Uh, this is Ron Clark. Um, I want to ask Rick a, a loaded question. Um, you presented your project as a kind of um, focused deterrence in a focused deterrence framework. What I found most interesting about your project was the, um, uh, the incredible uh, investment in the um, immobilizers, a very large investment. Um, I wonder if that was really what worked. The answer to that is that it was both because the, the focused deterrence component started prior to the immobilizers, and each of those uh, blocks of 50,000 immobilizers took over a year to, uh, to put into effect because uh, you know, there, there weren't uh, hundreds of shops that were doing the in installs and things. So my guess would be that about half of the impact was due to uh, the, the focused deterrence part so we kept riding herd on the kids. Uh, the other half was, was with the, uh, the immobilizers. And I think the, the fact that, that the reduction has continued since we've withdrawn the, the focused deterrence part because auto theft, the auto theft problem was no longer severe enough to have that level of investment. Uh, that continuation, is, I think, is... Uh, is pretty much because of the immobilizers and also because we broke what was a culture of auto theft in, among some segments of young people in the community. But I'm gonna try and, when I work this paper out, I'm gonna try and uh, make that phasing a little clearer to, to uh, address the issue that you're raising there. Um, yes, uh, but I wonder if you just had done the immobilizer project, um, it might have delayed the other stuff a bit, but you'd have got the same result in the end from the immobilizers. Yeah, that may be the case, and certainly if we had only done the, the uh, project dealing with uh, trying to deter the youth, uh, we would have had to keep it going for, for much, much longer. So uh, I, I don't disagree at all that, that the immobilizers were, were a unique factor with, with auto theft. And, uh, and that they were a uh, significant part of the, of the success of the project. Yeah, well, following up on that, I wonder if that diffusion of benefits that you noticed in which crimes like robbery and burglary were dropping as well, if you could attribute those drops to simply the, the fact that the, the offenders no longer had the transportation to get to the targets, 
or whether it really was a function of the focus deterrence initiative in which they were genuinely changing their behavior. Yeah, I think it was. A, we interviewed the kids about it, and they clearly uh, expressed that they, they had altered their behavior because they knew they were going to be held accountable, that uh, you know they were given uh, cell phones and they knew the phone was going to go off and they had to uh, account for where they were. They knew that there could be a knock on the door with the police stolen auto unit at any time of the day or night. So, uh, and, and also they were, uh, some of the people that they associated with, you know, gang colleagues and things, uh, were rejecting them because they were called heat magnets. So, you know, when you come around, there's always people with you that we don't want to deal with. Yeah. So they were losing friends and things. Interesting. Gary. If I could ask you, Johannes, uh, um, you may have mentioned this and I may have missed it, but the original thought that the, uh, uh, the illegal cab drivers were asylum seekers um, and whether that turned out to be correct and also whether there were any concerns that you had, uh, sort of social justice concerns that, you know, that eliminating the illegal cab drivers had made life more difficult for people in unfortunate situations. Um, well, rather great proportion of uh, the illegal cab drivers were asylum seekers. Uh, but they didn't uh, stay at asylum seekers uh, uh, where they place them. And, uh, but that's what the police believed. And in, in uh, Norway, it, it's a crime to, to carry out this type of service. And many uh, of the asylum seekers, they come from, came from countries where it wasn't a crime. So uh, part of uh, the solution was to um, uh, make leaflets that they handed out to suspected illegal cab drivers. And the police are really ingenious because they, they knew a lot of people who spoke different languages. So they asked them to translate uh, uh, the, the leaflet to all these uh, languages. Uh, no, I don't think it's a social injustice thing. It, it's, uh, of course, when you come to a new country, you have to stick to the rules and accept the laws that they... Have. And we also found that some of the illegal cab drivers, they were just ordinary Norwegian criminals. Did you see any evidence of any of the illegal drivers subsequently applying and going through the process to become legal drivers? No, I, no, I don't think so. No. Okay. No. Uh, we can come back to the specifics of, oh, yeah, uh, Tamara? Hi guys, Tamara Harold. So I have two questions. First one for Johannes. Your map and looking at that now, having all the experiences that we've had in Cincinnati, it looked a lot like a place network map. So when they made all of those changes at all of those dis different locations, I would suspect you had a lot more place management in locations where you didn't before, where they were allowing these illegal taxi operators to operate. Did you find that crime changed? I know you said there was no increase in assaults that you could find, but did you find that other crime types went down? Did you guys look for that at the time? Um, you know, I, actually, we, we didn't look for other types of crimes, but, but we, I was there, did five site visits, so I could see by myself that there were some efforts of the legal cab drivers to try to pick up customers at other places, but they were not as accessible. So. Uh, in effect, the police destroyed the market for them because the new pickup areas wasn't that good. Uh, and uh, we tried, I didn't mention it, but, but we also tried to uh, record number of assaults that occurred during uh, uh, illegal cab drives. And we found a couple of, of reported crimes and we also found a couple of allegations of rape. Uh, but in the follow-up period, we, we didn't uh, continue checking the crime records because it's pretty tedious and we didn't expect to find something uh, interesting. And for the tour of the crew, I know 
um, in a lot of the early domestic violence literature on interventions um, for domestic violence, they were finding that certain interventions worked better for some offender populations than for others. So I wondered if you had looked at that yet, or Deborah, if you were thinking of building that out as part of your analysis, or if I've missed that. Yeah, I couldn't quite, I don't quite understand the question. So uh, in early domestic violence intervention literature, they would find that arrest worked to deter future uh, domestic violence incidents, but only for offenders with certain characteristics or from certain backgrounds or certain demographics. So I'm looking, I'm just asking whether you're looking at the impact of your interventions on different offender populations, if it differs across different group, groups yeah. of people. So as I remember, one of those factors was whether or not the, the assaulting party had a job. Right. Employed and not unemployed. We, we clearly have some things interacting, and we haven't disentangled all of those right now. Um, in fact, we were having a question last week, you know, which comes first, crimes or calls to the police or arrest, and how they lag from one to another. They don't all co-occur at the same time, so um, we have a few more things to tease out in there, so. And would race be one of them, or ethnicity? Is that something you have data on to be able to? Yes, yeah. um, we added a data collection form that the officers completed every DV call they went on, collected things that they never collected before for non-crime calls. So employment's one of them, drugs and alcohol, mental health issues, um, some of the things that you see in the literature. And then we definitely have demographic information as well. We're hoping we have enough cases so that Deborah can identify what, what was the most compelling or impactful. The issue is we only have that in our experimental area. We don't have that more in-depth information on comparison area. So it'll be some things to tease out here. Mm -hmm. The next question will be over here. Oh, <laughs> I, I was going to do her job for her. <laughs> Uh, gentleman in the blue shirt, uh, uh, this direction. Us. Yeah, thank you. It, it, it might, your response may be the same, but I'm just curious along those lines. I was, before uh, Tamara's question, thinking the same thing about uh, evaluating any changes in victim dynamics as far as, since you have this approach that's it's in depth, um, if you can determine if the the repeat victims have a, a different sense of police trust. Are there, is there a likelihood that they're, they're going to recant less um, and report more? Um, and that may be too, too deep for where you're at now. But that was my thought is it, it's probable, I would think. We, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, we, we will be able to tell, well, I, we, we just looked at victims whether they were willing to call police again um, in different ways. As far as the recanting less, we haven't even really broached that. Yeah, one of the things as part of the prosecutor project is that we're also, we didn't have time to mention, one aspect is looking at body-worn camera evidence and whether that is helping with whether we're, uh, the DA's office, the prosecutors are more apt to file cases if they have because they're thinking, well, even if they recant, they already have the initial evidence on uh, camera. So that is one of the things we're looking at trying to figure that out um, as part of this bigger project that just started. Over here, Nancy. This is for the Chula Vista crew. Um, first of all, Great presentation, and I really appreciated the kind of way that, I guess I would call it triage, was built into the response. So you kind of categorize and, you know, you do your kind of lowest level intervention um, with the vast majority um, of the, the folks involved in the domestic violence and then kind of ratchet up from there, which we've seen um, be successful elsewhere. But my question is, I don't know, is something you can really answer because it might be political. But I'm really fixated on sustainability or, or lack thereof. Um, we heard it from Ron Clark's presentation this morning. Um, I'll be telling a similar tale tomorrow. 
Um, and then uh, in Chula Vista, it was hitting the pause button. And I'm just kind of curious, like, what's the rationale for pausing when you have initial evidence that it works and you want to expand? Um, and, and does it have to do with buy-in of leadership? Or, like, what are some of the dynamics there? Because I think, you know, this is a challenge for all of us, is figuring out what goes into sustaining or, or not um, these types of interventions over time and what role can we all play in, in promoting sustainability? Yeah, um, well, we didn't see results until after they had been in place for a year. And so there's initial upfront investment. Um, we asked officers, rather than spending time on traffic stops or certain types of FIs to do these follow-ups. We're doing a cost-benefit analysis, but we haven't completed it yet. Um, initially, it looked like there was enough patrol time saved down the road to almost even things out, but there is that initial upfront investment. Our staffing super thin. Um, our chief is very supportive, trying to think about a way to make this. She wants to scale it citywide, <coughs> and we're still sorting out which pieces were the most effective. Like my gut feeling was, I don't know. There's no real evidence, but I think that the in-person follow-ups really shook people up. Las Vegas has taken this on and replicated it in a slightly different way. They're doing in-person follow-ups with just DV disturbance calls, not just crimes. They saw an immediate reduction of like 20%. Um, and so I think a lot of it is just making the case that this is uh, cost neutral potentially and worth it for a lot of different reasons. Um, back here to Gary. For Rick, it's not a pop question, I don't think, but maybe a criminological question. I mean, what the heck is it with Winnipeg and stealing cars? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on in Winnipeg where they steal cars so much? Uh, they attribute it to just a development of a youth culture, and that, that was what came out of the interviews we did. I mean, there's, there's a myth, uh, perhaps a mythical story of that uh, around 1993, some kids came into town from Thunder Bay, Ontario, and were admitted to the youth center. And while they were in there, they taught all the other kids in the youth center how to get cars going. And when, they, when the kids got out, they started, there was one thing, and this isn't myth, there was a thing called a Buick Club, and to join it, you had to steal a Buick. And so it, it sort of became part of, among a certain segment of our population, just the thing to do. And they would, one of the patterns I didn't talk about is that kids would, uh, at school at, at noon, they'd go out and steal a, a, a caravan or, or Voyager so you can pile about six or seven cars in, go to McDonald's, then come back for the afternoon of school and just leave it on the street. So it was, it was that casual. And contests of how many cars can you bring to a shopping mall parking lot at night in three or four hours. And they would have like a winner of that. So it just became a thing, uh, which a is, bad. that's not a really precise sociological explanation, but it's as good as I can come up with. Well, there is a, a sociology of fads and yeah. trends like that, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask e each of you to reflect on outside of the particular impact that your initiative had on the local problem, what one or two aspects of the initiative do you think, if more widely replicated and adopted by agencies throughout the world, would greatly improve policing. What was, what was unique about this that was a real departure from conventional policing in that jurisdiction that you'd like to recommend to other agencies, either as it relates to the changing of the police organization or the introduction of outside partners into this? What, what takeaway lessons that might transcend the particular project? Deborah? I think the one thing you know, in particular, and there are so many elements of our project, it really will take us a while to sort them all out. Um, but the police initially want to do our project citywide, and honestly, it's just by holding them back to just test it in one small area, which meant you're doing less, right, than citywide, and really having a chance to work through it. It gave them a chance to answer some questions. Um, just for example, during the course of our project, we could look at things like adoption of body-worn cameras and how it changed impact in one area versus the other. Or as we've gone through concerns about immigration with, um, you know, the building of the wall, you know, and, and immigrants' issues in there, there's some comments that it's suppressing crime reporting 
by Hispanic victims. And we can see we don't see any evidence of that because we have the same thing in both of our areas there. So by not doing something, you have a better test of whether what you did do worked if you can sustain it for a while. Okay, sticking with Chula Vista, um, Julie. Um, I, I had a bit of a dual role um, when I when they first started their project. I was assigned to be the subject matter expert as part of a, a Bureau of Justice Assistance grant, and so I was an outside perspective, but obviously very familiar. Um, and that what that led to, I think, most importantly, is that the prosecutor saw value in this looking at data and analyzing it as a problem. And as, as I mentioned, that I had worked for the prosecutor as a crime analyst for a number of years, and very few people saw problem solving, problem-oriented policing, even partnering with the police on a problem as something that they did. And so to finally be able to see that a prosecutor high up in the organization, saw value in what the police did, and said, you know, let's all work together at a bigger level, um, I think is, is really important to, to go out and ask. And I have worked with a lot of police and a handful of prosecutors, and we often hear, oh, they won't want to work with us. And it, it doesn't hurt to ask, and it doesn't hurt to be pushy, too. Karen? Well, um, two things. I would definitely say the follow-ups potentially have a lot of promise. And I think officers, when they're freed up, and they know that they, they, don't, they can go back to a problem location if they think that would be helpful, that it's not a one and done situation if they have that flexibility. Um, but also, the techs seem like they might have some potential as well. I don't know that we have enough of them to um, be sure with this project, but with the, the district attorney's project, we're talking about maybe potentially doing a series of texts that are scheduled behavior modification types of texts. There's a lot of good research out there right now on how to do that. And so we, I'm hopeful that we can look into that and others might try it too. Do, do you imagine this might transcend even domestic related conduct that it could apply to other policing problems, this notion of persistent follow-up with either victims or offenders? Definitely, chronic noise <clears throat> complaints, um, any sorts of things where you know it's gonna keep going. It's just not gonna stop unless we do something different. Okay. Rick? I would have two. One is collaboration. Uh, in, in the case of the auto theft project, it was mainly within the justice system, but, uh, you know, for example, the prosecutors thought it was wonderful that they could sit across the table and say to the police, uh, we'd like you to do a different, fill in these forms differently. You don't have to go up to the, the head prosecutor and then across to the police chief and then mm -hmm. down in which, you know, the message diffusion uh, experiments show that that doesn't work very well. Right. So that was critical. Along uh, with the resentment that comes from having being ordered to do something. Yeah, and instead, <laughs> you know, on a, on a task force, people are, are friends, right. colleagues, so you can, you can go across the table and you're not threatening anybody. You're just saying, hey, we're trying to accomplish something. It'll work better if you do the forms this way, just mm -hmm. as one small example. Yeah. And uh, the other is, is uh, the frustrating, and this came up this morning again, the frustrating the long time it's getting to get police executives to actually buy into running their departments on a problem-oriented basis. Uh, it, to me, is, is bizarre in the extreme that we have to keep reinventing. And as you and I talked uh, this morning, uh, you can have something successful and then the chief changes and all of a sudden you got to start right back at square one again because often that change will alienate so many of the senior people that all the supporters of a particular uh, way of doing something will leave. And it's, it's really frustrating that that institution is, you know, the old bending granite analogy uh, still applies. So, yeah. so the, you know, it's not a lesson, but it's a, it's a question. How, how, do you, how do you turn that? And I know, you know, you've devoted a good segment of your life to trying to do that, as have a number of other people in this room. And it, it just, not only doesn't it happen overnight, it doesn't happen over decades. <laughs> uh, Johannes, give you the last word here. Um, well, I'm, I'm a little disappointed. I had hoped for a greater impact, that there would be a greater interest in, in conducting other problem-oriented policing projects. But as to the police force, uh, they, we, we um, created uh, a really good working relationship. So I continued to try to help them make a follow-up 
uh, routine for the criminal investigations because they have this uh, idiotic uh, fixation to the clearance rate. Uh, and I try to uh, get into all the statistics that are available and to make it meaningful for the uh, middle rank leaders and also for those who were involved with it. And uh, after a couple of years, I think I was successful with doing that. Very good. So you join me in thanking the panelists. Okay, thank you all. <laughs>